Well, thank you, Sunday School. And uh, Let's turn now in God's Word. We've been looking at, uh, I was asked a while ago to preach a series, and we're coming to the end of it, close to the end of it, and we've got a few more uh, sermons on it. Uh, we'll be dealing with prayer next time, and then I do want to deal with hospitality after that, but we've been talking about revitalization, what God uses in the church, and, and I know we, we sit there and look at so many different things, but, but God does give us tools to use in his church to bring life and to defend and protect us as well. And so let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6 as we return now, looking at the armor of God, and we're at the very last weapon, uh, the last piece of the armor God gives, and this is actually a weapon. This is the Christian sword. And let's stand as we look at this together. We're looking, uh, beginning with verse 10, but we're focusing on verse 17, the second part of verse 17. Hear God's words. Paul is addressing the Ephesian church, saying this is what you need to be, and this is what you need to do as a church, this is what you need to believe. And now he writes this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the de evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, you think about it, because that's what revitalization, we're, we're, we're desiring for God to use us to make an impact, to, to impact our church and impact the world. And you think about the person that probably had the, some of the greatest impact in our lives are our mothers or fathers or grandmothers and grandmothers. So Mother's Day is a good time to rejoice in the, in the privileges that God has providentially given you mothers and grandmothers to have that lasting impact for God's glory. You've cared for and taught your children and grandchildren so many things, but most of all about, hopefully, uh, about the precious, our precious Redeemer and Lord, Jesus Christ. You've invested yourself in your children, rejoicing in, in their successes and, 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 yes, even taking it personally when they forget or turn away from the Lord. Fathers do too. Proverbs 10 tells us a wise son makes glad his father or makes a glad father but a foolish son is the grief of his mother I guess it's a little more personal to mothers than it is to fathers but you think about it what can we teach our children what can we cling to ourselves in order to stand in order to have victory and be used by God to have an eternal impact in this broken world a world where there is a spiritual battle going on. That's what Paul is ending this, this chapter with to the Ephesian church. And we need to remember it as well. It's a spiritual battle with eternal winners and losers. And while God uses mothers to help us greatly in this, which is why Paul in 2 Timothy praises the God-given Christian faith uh, of Timothy's grandmother and mother, yet the reality is our Heavenly Father gives us what we ultimately and absolutely need. Something that, frankly, may be offensive to some in this day and age. You think about it, we have some that, that take offense at a children's finger gun. That's the scariest thing that there is. And yet, what does God say here? God has given his children the only powerful and effective weapon against the most powerful enemy of your and my souls. 
the devil. And this weapon is not to murderously strike out like so many on the news do, which is disgusting. And understand this has been happening for a long time. It's just the news prompt makes it prominent. But God holds out spiritual armor, and now he adds a spiritual weapon, commanding us to wield this weapon, to defend and attack with in this lifelong battle. And it's the sword of the Spirit. This is the Christian sword. And, and since this is so powerful, we must ask, what is this weapon? And how do we use it? When Paul, in the second part of verse 17, tells us, take the sword of the Spirit, what's he talking about? Well, one of the things, remember, again, the context is he's making a spiritual application. He's looking to this Roman soldier that he's been chained to because of preaching the gospel, because preaching about how God saves sinners by grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And Paul sees on this soldier's hip, on his belt, is this sword, makaria. It's called a makaria. That's the Greek word he uses here. And this is not a broad sword. They had something like that. You, know, you think about all the pictures and the knights that we see and this huge sword. No, this is, this is a small sword. Uh, it's the sword which the apostle Peter carried. Remember, Peter used it to cut off the high priest's ear when Jesus was arrested. Peter thought he would deliver him for some reason. And this sword was to be used when the enemy was up close and personal in your face. And the Roman soldiers were so well trained in this. They knew how to repel every attack and they knew how to drive in for the kill with this sword. Now again, it's not a physical sword we're called, we're called to wield. We're, we're called to wield the spiritual sword that God has given us. And, and we're to be trained with it, and we're to train you children with it as well. It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Sometimes in catechism class, the kids remember, I'll say, uh, I'll mention sword drills. Well, this is the sword that God has given us. And we need this weapon because no battle or war has ever been won without hitting back without retaliating. And that's true of our fight against Satan, the devil, the world, and our own flesh. And this sword comes not from some sort of force like we think about with Star Wars and things like that, some impersonal thing out there, but this force comes from a person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, of our triune God. He is the author of the word of God. This is why we're told in scripture that, that God, men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. This is from God. The God who is true. And since it's God's word and it's infallible and without errors or mistakes, this is why David wrote, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There's something else I think that's important for us to know. As we look at this word and we have this in our hands, this word is complete. Uh, we're not waiting for some more information. We, we don't have to seek out some secret little tidbit somewhere or, or from some other source. I mean, it's helpful. It's kind of nice. There was just a, a report just recently that, that, that told uh, that, that they think that uh, in Numbers, that Balak, the king, uh, they found his name on an inscription. And that, that, that's, a, that's always neat to us. It's not why we believe the Bible, but it's because God's word is true. That this shouldn't surprise us. But this word, we have to understand, is not just true. It is complete because Proverbs 30 tells us Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. In fact, one of the last warnings that Jesus gives at the very end of the Bible, the book, at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus warns not to add or take away from his word, or he'll add the plagues 
that are promised in the book of Revelation. How do you and I look at this word? Is it just an add-on to our life? Something if we have time, we look at? Understand, if you're too busy to read God's word, you're too busy. What does God say? About his word. We read, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and truth. And we have to ask, do you believe God's word is what you need? Do you believe, as God says, that the word of God is, is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, things that, that, that are indivisible. God can divide by his word. He can get to the heart of an issue. And discern our thoughts and intents, even of our hearts. Do you believe this? Or when trials arise, when sorrows overwhelm, when Satan assaults, do we first go to Google? To surveys? Maybe sinfully talking to the dead as King Saul did? Do we go to a psychiatrist or a doctor? Understand, even the best doctors, and I'm not against them, they're, they're, the Lord uses them at times, but at best they can only put a band-aid on our ultimate festering problems of sin and death and God's judgment. And dear friends, let me impress what, what God is telling you this morning. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The comforter, the, the helper who brings conviction and life, His words are in your hands. Nothing else can help you like God's own Word. Do you understand that? This is the only word which Scripture tells us that, that works in us to be born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And, and understand, and I know sometimes people will say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit was talking to me the other day. Well, really, the Holy Spirit might have been giving you an impression but sadly, in my life, I've often heard people say that, and then they say something which totally contradicts the Bible. And when that happens, don't believe them, because the Holy Spirit will not work against the triune God and what, what's been revealed in the Holy Spirit's Word. And we have this weapon... This weapon that Paul directs our attention to of the triune God who, who always works with his word, not against it. And, and, and just like in the army with the, the government issued weapons, you can't go and join the army and say, well, you know, I like my hunting rifle better. No, well, everybody gets the same weapon depending on what your specialty is. The same thing. God has issued the weapon. He will give you what we need for, for the work of the church, for the work of the ministry. He gives us his word, which brings life. This is why Jesus said it this way. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, in, in John 5, he said this, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Wow. This is so important. As we think of the work of the church, as we think about the subject even of revitalization, about the life that, that God gives, this is not about what we can manipulate for, for a short-term response. No. Scripture shows clearly spiritual life does not come through the stirring of emotions with lights and sounds or, or this method or that method. It doesn't come from watering down God's word or taking God's word totally out of the service. 
I'm saying, well, you know, singing hymns is more important. It doesn't come from preaching to itching ears, which 2 Timothy 4, 3 warns about. And remember, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I forgot to include that in the previous statement. See, the Holy Spirit works by the preaching pure word of God. Yeah, sometimes it'll harden a heart, while at other times it'll bring others to repentance. If you're struggling, repenting over a certain sin, get your nose in God's word, prayerfully looking at it. If you want victory over a certain sin, get your nose into God's word. Desire the milk and the meat of God's word. Grow by it. That's the only way that God has given us to grow in the Christian life. Yes, he uses others, but he uses his word. He uses them to help us to point to his word. Think about Acts 2. The most successful, if you want to put it in the worldly way, the most powerful sermon in the history of the world. 3,000 people truly came to faith. And it wasn't by signs. Uh, the, yes, the people thought that the apostles were drunk. They knew something happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out. But, but it wasn't by a lot of stories, but it was by the preaching of God's word and the Holy Spirit applying that word to mind and hearts, which brought true spiritual life. Acts 2.37 even tells us how this sword wielded in Peter's hand, what the effect was. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The sword of the Spirit, the preaching of the Word of God, cut them and brought them to repentance and saving faith. Not an emotional high. When the communists took over the Soviet Union in 1912, they decided to attack Christianity. And they would say, well, you know, that here's this contradiction here. You know, they take something out of context. They wouldn't look at the fact that we have eyewitnesses speaking about the same thing from different angles at times. And, and so they would, they would say, well, this is a conflict here. And, and so what they would do is they'd print these whole Bible passages, actually, and then try to tear it apart one by one. Didn't take long, but the printing presses had to stop printing these communist or these socialist tracts. And again, the point was to destroy Christianity with this tract. And yet God used these snippets of different passages from the Bible to bring many people to faith in Christ. And so they stopped printing it. This is the weapon that God has given you and I. If the enemies of God... try to at least show God's word, and God uses that, he can use you and I. But the question we have to ask, lastly then, is how do we wield the sword of the Spirit? And now we can watch movies uh, like The Princess Bride and see incredible Hollywood sword fights going back and forth, back and forth, and, and these actors, and, and it's a fun movie, uh, they practiced and trained, actually. These were not stuntmen. These were the actual actors. They trained to fight with swords, both with their left hand and with their right. It's a fun, fun scene. But they had to study. They had to learn that. And much more, we need to learn to use the sword the Holy Spirit gives us. For just as the, the sword does no good if it stays in a sheath in the midst of a battle, so the Bible does no good sitting on the shelves or occupying an untouched app on our phone. And I know the world will sit there and say, but I don't believe in the Bible. But you think about it. If you went to war and you pulled out that sword, or nowadays you pulled out the gun, if the enemy sat there and said, I don't believe in guns, you're going to drop that gun? It doesn't matter. Whether the enemy believes in that gun or that sword, it's going to hurt him. And it will defend you and protect your life. And the greatest example of using the sword of the Spirit is Jesus. <laughs> when he was tempted in Matthew 4. Read Matthew 4 this week. Go through that temptation. 
and, and read how Jesus faced this temptation. It begins right there in Matthew 4, telling us Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Some of us struggle missing one meal. Jesus missed 40 days and nights. And it says the devil came and tempted him, saying, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. The devil tempted Jesus to use his own power for his own gain and for his own will. And how did Jesus respond? I mean, he was hungry. Well, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus didn't sit there and say, well, well I better look at the glossary you know, in, the, in the back of the Bible here. Um, he, he didn't say, well, hold on a second, let me get my Google app out here and, and check this out. No, he had scripture memorized, including the book of Deuteronomy, a book that, that a lot of people skip over, but all of his statements in defining against the Bible came from Deuteronomy. And when the devil then, eventually you'll see, as, as the devil attacked him with a temptation, Jesus answered with a scripture saying, it is written. And even then the devil says, well, you know the scripture out here. I'll give you a scripture verse. I'll pull it out of context. And even when that happened, Jesus answered again with a scripture passage. How are we answering the assaults of the devil when we're tempted? We need to answer it with scripture. Those attacks. Because if Jesus memorized scripture to face temptations, that's what we need to do. I mean, how do we... Remember the promise that, that God gives us through James is that we can resist the devil so he'll flee from you. And that's what Jesus did. He resisted the devil with, with God's word. Every uh, uh, attack that the devil made, Jesus parried it and he attacked back. And what happened? Eventually the devil left him. How are we going to resist the devil? It's by God's word. We need to study it. We need to prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand and use the tools that God has given. Now we, we can put so many different Bible uh, versions on the Bible and study Bibles on our phones and things like that, but particularly understand that the best ones are the Reformation Study Bible, the Reformation Heritage Study Bible. There's some others, the ESV and even the NIV Application Study Bible. Though Those are good, helpful books. But also go to the commentaries too. Calvin's commentaries are free. Study God's word. Saturate your mind and heart by reading it over and over. Study it carefully, prayerfully. To be honest, there shouldn't be a person here. If you really want to fight in this war that we are in, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, there shouldn't be a person here that's not in, a woman that's not in our women's group or men that's not in our men's group or they're not in our Bible study on the Sunday morning. I was impressed in Bakersfield when we went there. It was almost the whole church. There were very, only a few people didn't go. But the whole church was in Bible study. And I know there's some things that are hard to understand. That's the nice thing about Bible study. You can ask those questions. Peter even says that about Paul. But, but there's some things even that we will never fully understand until Christ returns. But no, every heart is converted, transformed, and strengthened by God's word alone. Every great revival in church history has been born and sustained by the preaching of God's word. That's why the devil wants to snatch it away or choke it out by the cares of this world. Because God has promised to use his word. Isaiah 55 says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth, making it bring forth bud and fruit, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, even that, that we take up on our lips. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I want to ask you, again, it's Mother's Day. And some of you miss your mothers desperately. If you had a letter from your mother, would you leave it unopened, unread? You'd say, absolutely not. You're hungry to hear her words. Well, how much hungrier should we be 
to hear the words of our living God. And brothers and sisters in Christ, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts and uncles, the most important thing that you can do for yourself, the most impactful thing which will bring you joy and glory to God is to point not just your kids, but, but your own heart and everyone around you to God's word. Speaking it, praying for the Holy Spirit to work by his word, by his sword, and know the word of God and study it. Wield this sword. Use the Holy Spirit's words. You know, this is an amazing sword because other swords, if you've ever dealt with a knife or a sword, it grows dull, and, it, and yet this sword grows sharper with every use. And we must use it because we are in a battle with heaven or hell before us. This is why Charles Hodge, he was the Reformed preacher and teacher at Princeton. Princeton was started uh, to defend the Reformed faith and to teach the gospel. And in the 1800s, uh, Charles Hodge wrote this. He says, all triumphs over sin and error have been affected by the word of God. So long as she, the church, uses this and relies on it alone, she goes on conquering. But when anything else, be it reason, science, tradition, or the commandments of men, is allowed to take its place or share its office, then the church or the Christian is at the mercy of the adversary. You want to have an impact in this life, which is joyful, then, then, then take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Encourage others to do the same as well. There's no other way to victory. There's no other way to glorify God than this. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this mighty weapon which you have given us. We have to confess to our shame. We don't use it like we should. It, it sits there on our coffee table, on our bookshelf. We have not even been interested in using this weapon. We've gone other places first. And we pray, Lord, help us to truly repent of our disinterest and even spiritual laziness. And even on this day, which is the Lord's day, give us a zeal to open up your word, to know it, to study it, and to use it. Bring us to the maturity by your word, because that is your appointed means to give life and comfort and blessing and eternal life. Make us to take up this sword that the Holy Spirit uses in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name.